It is now my pleasure to welcome our speaker for today. He is the founding founder and managing director of Kogan Global Advisory, an instructor for Harvard DCE professional development, teaching advanced negotiation skills and essential manage management skills for emerging leaders, a guest lecturer at the Harvard Kennedy School, and a co-author of the book, Mediation, Negotiation by Other Moves. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Eugene B. Kogan. Welcome, Eugene. Thanks very much, uh, Jacqueline, and welcome everybody. I'm delighted to be here to lead this webinar on how we bargain with the toughest uh, counterparts. Um, as I uh, kick this off, I invite you to share in the chat uh, where you're from, uh, where you're joining from uh, city and country, would love to know the diversity of views that will be represented at today's uh, webinar. As you share that, let, let me mention briefly that I am uh, delighted to be uh, teaching uh, two upcoming programs uh, this year on advanced negotiation skills and hope you might join me actually at Harvard, not only online at Harvard, but um, live online and uh, in person, whether in March, or in August. Let me take a look at the chat. Irvine, Waltham, um, Bonn, Germany, wonderful. Boulder, Colorado, Kiev, Ukraine, welcome. Noblesville, Indiana, Munich, Denmark, um, wonderful. Uruguay, Texas, uh, Saudi Arabia, New York City, uh, welcome, everybody. I'm delighted that you are here. Uh, terrific to have this uh, uh, great uh, group of uh, intellect and, and, and talent. So what we're going to do today is uh, really in three steps. Um, I'm going to chat with you a little bit uh, about the Harvard approach to handling the most difficult counterparts where perhaps strong emotions are uh, in play and how to um, uh, how to bring that kind of negotiation to a win-win solution. Uh, and hopefully this will serve as a great, uh, uh, this and the, the sample activity that I have for you will serve as a, as a good example of the type of learning that we do here at Harvard. Uh, that will inspire you and entice you to come and join not only me, but my colleagues in, uh, in learning uh, together. And then we will have a, a great uh, Q&A uh, session to follow that uh, later in the hour. So uh, let's uh, kick this off and talk about what I call the orange dilemma. And the orange dilemma for many of you uh, maybe who have read the book, Getting to Yes, the foundational book of the Harvard Method, uh, you may be familiar with the dilemma that, that a mother of two uh, girls faced when both girls demanded the same orange. One said, I want the orange, and the other said, I want the orange. And many of, and, and one of you, I, I can see in the chat, one of you is reading it right now, and it's terrific because it's a terrific book that really exemplifies the Harvard method. And you, those of you who have read it or reading it right now, remember what happened. The mother, of course, sliced the orange in half and gave uh, one half of the orange to one daughter and one half of the orange to the other daughter. What happened next? What happened next is that one daughter ate the orange. Very um, unsurprising and threw away the peel. Yet the other daughter peeled the orange and ate the cake with the peel and threw away the fruit itself. And what, of course, Rod, the great Roger Fisher, the, the, the dean of the Harvard negotiation method, the, uh, the godfather, if you will, to use to, to reference one of my favorite movies, 
what Roger Fisher and his co-authors, Bill Urie and Bruce Patton, are trying to say with this example is that there's a difference between what people say they want, maybe in the thrust of uh, emotions. You know, I demand that you give me this in this negotiation. Otherwise, it will be a deep offense to me that you haven't. There's a difference between, between what people say they want and what they truly need. And if only this difference was clear to the daughters who were fighting over that one orange, if they could ask each other penetrating questions about the why do you want the orange, they could have established that the underlying interests the the what we really need were different from the superficial positions, the stated expressed interest that we have in the orange. So the positions versus interests is a very fundamental principle of the Harvard method, and it really underlies our approach as we handle difficult negotiations. So let's dig in then into how we could handle a contentious conversation. Because one of the most difficult things in a contentious conversation is to listen effectively. And that's what I want to focus on on this next slide, is the active listening uh, principles. And the active listening principles begin with the first principle that may initially strike you as so obvious that you may be thinking, why is Eugene even talking about this? And yet, think about it. No pun intended. Think about it. Think about what the other person is saying especially in a contentious negotiation, this probably is the most challenging thing to do. Because if you catch yourself, think to a contentious negotiation today that or, or a disagreement that you may be having with somebody about whether it's current events or a business negotiation. So hard, in fact, to indeed step into the other person's intellectual space and think through what they are saying. It is the hardest thing to do, and yet it is, folks, the most important thing to do when you are trying to do active listening. Give that person you are talking to, however much you disagree with them, however much you think they are wrong and even, even however much you dislike them personally, think about what they're trying to say. You are trying, just like in the example of the, of the orange that we just shared, you are trying to get to the underlying interests. What is it that this person is trying to get at beyond what they said superficially? So thinking is really important. Likewise important is to demonstrate with your body language that you are actually listening. You have to be aware of the fact that the person speaking to you wants to be not just listened to, but heard. And so especially in the world of Zoom in which we are right now, you can see that I am focusing directly into the camera, not away from the camera looking at my screen, or where your faces would be if this were a Zoom call, but I'm focused just literally on that little black dot called the camera. And I do that because I want you to feel that I'm speaking to you directly. This is always my advice when coaching executives, teaching groups uh, at Harvard and elsewhere, always my advice to you with your body language to demonstrate that you are with that person. A simple trick, but an important one to show respect and to show we may disagree, but I am with you. I am in your space and I am giving you the time to understand what you are, what you're going through and what you are thinking without agreeing, as we will talk about momentarily. Now, 
here comes what in the negotiation literature, this is the beginning of what we call the empathy loop. The empathy loop begins with the rephrasing of what you hear. Notice the first word. Folks, this is not repeating what you heard. This is rephrasing what you heard. Rephrasing what you heard is really important for the following reason. There are people out there, and this is especially true when emotions are running high, but even when the emotions are not running high, there are people out there, and okay, I, I will be perfectly honest with you, I am one of those people. I plead guilty to being a fast talker, right? I talk pretty fast, and sometimes my mouth gets away from my brain. Folks, this is true. So many people, especially when emotions are running high, they will say something that they haven't thought through very well. Rephrasing what you hear gives you an opportunity to give the person a second chance. To say, you know, I, I, I think what I heard is the following, but correct me if I'm wrong. And what you're giving the person opportunity to do is once they pull down a little bit to say, whoa, whoa, hold on. I, I really didn't mean it that way. I really didn't mean that. Or maybe you misunderstood me, right? So rephrasing is a great way of double checking your understanding of giving the other side an opportunity to walk back something that's particularly perhaps inflammatory, particularly triggering perhaps, right? So this is a good third principle of active uh, listening. The third, the, the fourth principle from the third, which is rephrasing what you hear, is probing for the underlying meaning. There's you are engaging in the hard work of the Harvard method, which is digging for underlying interests. You're digging for what does the person really mean, right? So in, in addition to rephrasing, number three and number four are tied together. They're going together. You are saying, hey, hold on. So what, what, I, what, what I feel you're, you're saying, what I feel is really important for you is the following. So that's the sort of the meat of the empathy uh, loop. Now, you would be very right at this point to say, Eugene, hold on. This is all great. I'm empathizing here. But what if, as emotions are running high, this is maybe an aggressive negotiator, somebody who may not have read getting to yes, right? Maybe instead of getting to yes, the only book they read is Art of the Deal. And they think that that's the way you negotiate. You dominate the conversation. You're right. Folks, you're absolutely right. We don't just step do step one through four. We also do step five. And step five says we balance empathy and assertiveness. Because empathy is not sympathy. Let us be absolutely clear, right? And you will get certain negotiators. I've had negotiators in my life who would say to me, oh, this is terrific. You are, you're listening so attentively. You're with me. You're with me on this, so we agree. And my advice is very simple. Whenever I teach these classes at Harvard, this question always comes up, and I always say it's a simple, polite, but firm phrase. Please don't mistake my questions to be a sign of agreement. Folks, questions are not agreement. 
The fact that you want to understand how somebody thinks does not mean that you take their point of view. The fact that you step into their intellectual space and walk through their logic, in other words, engage in empathy, put yourself into their shoes, does not mean that you sympathize. In other words, take their point of view, believe what they believe. But this, folks, this is on you. I want to there to be no ambiguity about this. The assertiveness is on you to say, I absolutely listen, but I absolutely do not claim to agree or not to agree. The assertiveness has to be there, but the assertiveness does not have to take over the empathy. The two actually coexist. Not only that, but you can, in fact, and I encourage you to think about questions as you listen, to think about questions that truly deepen the conversation. And this is the, the, the first kind of activity that I often do when I do corporate training and I do these classes at Harvard. I love asking the following question, and maybe I'd love to get some answers uh, in the chat, which I will monitor. And the question is, what is an example, do you think, of a question that deepens the conversation rather than shuts it down during, during a negotiation? Let's give it 15 seconds or 30 seconds. I'd love to. You. Yes, what? Exactly, Corey. Why? Tell me more about that, Shima. Exactly. Why is this important to you? Great. Can you help me understand? Why do you believe that? Can you help me understand? Can you expand on this? How did you arrive at that point, Marsha? Great. That's that's the, the, the how did you arrive at that point is a great example of asking for justifications, right? One of the things. I sense some frustration, what seems to be the issue. Interesting, can you elaborate on that? Good, good. Um, oftentimes when I coach people on salary negotiations or on price negotiations, and people help me understand exactly. So when I coach people on salary negotiations or price negotiations, I oftentimes get a a question, well, what do I do when I get an unreasonable number? Or what do I do when I get any number, in fact? And the question always has to be one that leads the other person to reveal the logic behind the number. It can't be just a number because the number is just a position. Remember, position is what you claim you want. Interest is what underlies the position, the, the true motivations that lead you to want what you say you want. And so you say, help me understand how you got there, right? Help me understand is a great, is a great phrase, um, is a great phrase that, uh, that I always recommend. So here are, uh, folks, a few examples of deepening questions. And these questions are actually based on the book, the mediation book that I've been honored to co-author with several distinguished colleagues. And, and maybe uh, my, my colleagues from Harvard Professional Development Programs will put the, the link to the book in the chat. So these are, these are um, four different types of questions that can help you uh, deepen the conversation. One type of uh, question is a motivation-based question. So for example, this claim or this uh, fact appears to have affected you, you deeply. No? Is that, is that correct? Help me, help me understand why. The second type of deepening question is an elaboration question. 
For example, you shared earlier that something you observed really made you lose faith in the in the way the government works. Can can you can you share a little bit more about that? Again, you're showing engagement, you're showing specific attention to something that the other person has said. The third type of question is observation. Can you offer, you've said that you're against, for example, government waste. Can you offer an example of what you mean by that? And finally, imagination. Imagine that your manager has asked you for your opinion on this. Just imagine. I know this is a one of those one of those things that may never happen, but let's just say that it happens. What would you say on that? Right? So this is why the these types of questions are really important to keep listening. Listening is crucial in negotiation, especially, as I say, especially when the emotions are running high in our competitive impulses, the impulse to win, not to have a win-win, a mutually beneficial scenario outcome of the negotiation, but win. I win, you lose. That is the competitive impulse that prevails in the most emotional, the difficult scenarios. That is when these deepening questions are most important. And of course, questions are important in real life. So uh, as, a, as a quick uh, mid-webinar icebreaker, uh, maybe you can guess what the caption for this this cartoon would be. I'm looking at the chat. Let's see if you have over the next 15 seconds some creative, creative ideas. What does the lady say to the gentleman? This is a uh, uh, one of those tests for a Harvard style imagination. Let's see if anybody wants to uh, venture a guess. Okay, therapy, I recommend, right, I recommend this enlightening book that Eugene has co-authored to you. I'm busy reading, that's right. How, how do you feel about, right, exactly, pass the dog walking duties over to them. The book is great, I love this audience. This is my, absolutely my favorite audience. Unfortunately, unfortunately, that's not what the lady says to the man. The lady says, I'm sorry, dear, I haven't been listening, right? Could you repeat everything you've said since we've been married? So this is an example of why it's really important to, um, to listen in negotiation and in life. Although I must tell you, I am absolutely delighted that so many people thought that the book the lady was holding in her hands was... Um, was in fact the mediation book. Uh, so, or maybe getting to yes, uh, which is a great, great uh, uh, accompaniment to the uh, mediation book. So switching gears, practical tips, some practical tips for preparing yourself to, for face-to-face -face negotiation. And we'll come to, uh, we'll come to the uh, online negotiation momentarily. First of all, practice speaking your answers. Practicing speaking is super helpful, super important in the privacy of your own home or with a trusted friend. Practice speaking the answers to the most challenging questions. When, when challenged, or maybe when challenged angrily, right? Practice how you would respond. Second tip is video record yourself negotiating. This will reveal so much to you about your negotiation style. This will reveal so much to you about your pressure points. 
do not let yourself go into the most difficult negotiation, perhaps the most consequential negotiation where emotions may be involved without observing yourself. And this is in the Harvard parlance is called getting on the balcony. And if there is an if there is a metaphor that I'd like you to remember, I think this this comes from uh, from Ron Heifetz's work, Professor Ronald Heifetz, Harvard Kennedy School, uh, a wonderful teacher uh, and a scholar, um, a, an author of a number of books on leadership, including books on adaptive leadership specifically that I highly recommend. The idea is to get on the balcony. Get on the balcony meaning take perspective on yourself. Right, and when you video record yourself, you will notice so much about your body language. <laughs> As you can see, body language is a big deal with me. My body is moving like never before, right? My hands are always in the camera, but I at least I know that. And the reason I know that is that I video record myself and I observe myself uh, on, um, uh, on camera. And in the most intensive classes, when I do executive coaching with CEOs, this is what I really do recommend. And this is what we really do. If you have an opportunity to have several cameras, it would be great to have one, just a close up shot of you, another, a wide shot of the room. There's all kinds of ways to do this. If you have the resources to do it, I highly recommend it. And finally, practice radical empathy and radical empathy means literally putting yourself in the shoes of the other side and negotiating from their point of view did you record yourself negotiating from their point of view from the other sides you will understand their perspective the opposing sides much better feel their emotions if necessary folks feel their Frustration, if that's what it is. Elation, if that's what it is. Feel it. And then you will go into the negotiation much better prepared, feeling what they feel, knowing how they approach these issues, knowing, in fact, their strengths and weaknesses. Some practical tips on handling yourself during the face-to-face -face negotiation. If you feel like the the sides are closing on you. If you're really being pressured, take your time. Time is your friend. Take a break. Taking a break is really important. It should be negotiated from the beginning, right? When we, when we teach the Harvard method, we always talk about negotiating the process. When you negotiate the process, you negotiate at the beginning how to take good, timely breaks. Dig for interests. We've gone through this. Several of you said, help me understand. Help me understand why this is producing such a reaction. Help me understand why this is important. Probe for understanding, right? Don't assume that you understand correctly. Take it on yourself. Say, listen, if, if I got this right, and I maybe I'm wrong, in which case... Tell me, tell me and I'll take it back, right? So this is this is uh, uh, really important. And finally, again, brainstorm. Say, okay, what if we've, we've hit, especially this is a question I often get folks when people say we've hit a roadblock, price, be it price, be it something else. We've hit a roadblock. What do we do, Eugene? My advice is always to say, okay, let's take a step back for a moment. No commitment. No commitment. Just brainstorming here. Just, just thinking freely. We're not making a proposal. What if we were to deliver this such and such? What if we were to do this in this way? How would that move the needle for you? Right? Get people thinking creatively as you handle yourself during 
face-to-face -face negotiation. Some uh, tips for email and Zoom. Very On email, very simple. Print them out. I guarantee you the most important emails, right? The email that you write to me and say, this was the best webinar I've attended in years, or even better, ever, right? That email, you don't have to print out. Just click send. Uh, in all seriousness, the most important emails, print them out. And... Um, and, and, and you will see things that you will want to edit. It gives you time to reflect, build in that time for reflection. Read and keep to send later, especially when you've typed that email. And you know what I mean? When you were typing that you could hear the keyboard breaking under your fingers, when the <laughs> emotion was there we've all been there okay we've all been there read it print it sleep on it we read it tomorrow and decide whether to send it or not trust me you won't regret it they can wait a few hours or maybe 24 hours Emails are really great, by the way, for confirming key points of a verbal conversation. On, for example, on Zoom. And so on that, email can be a great advantage for Zoom. Speaking of Zoom, what do I call mirror test run? For this webinar, I've done a few of these in the sense that I connect with a colleague from Harvard and I say to them, can you photograph me on the screen and send me the photograph? This is another way of stepping on the balcony because I want to see what I look like to you. I want to make sure that I come across right to you. So that's, that mirror test run is a great tip that more people ought to do in my experience. From the classes I teach to the executives I coach, I find that more people would really benefit uh, from that. Curated first moments. First moments matter in negotiation. Folks, the first 60 seconds in negotiation are the... Uh, Crucial 60 seconds of negotiation. Log on early. Set the tone that you're already there. Be there when the other party arrives. Body language. Look straight to the camera. We've talked about that. Empathy assertiveness. If they come onto the screen and they say, oh, gee, I, I'm not turning my camera on today, your response is, good. I'm following suit. No need to be the person, the only person looking into that camera when the other person doesn't have the camera on. There's nothing wrong with it. Very polite. Let's just have an audio call. No problem. So those are the kind of the, the, the principle, the, the key tips for handling really all kinds of negotiations, but especially negotiations where you're dealing with assertive, compelling, strong-willed, maybe strongly emotional counterparts. Let me just give you a feel for what I do, just a quick feel for what I do uh, when we shift gears from how do we do negotiation, that was the meat of the webinar, to how we think like a negotiator. And that's the work that I call the Colgan framework that I teach in advanced negotiations. These are strategies for you to think like an expert deal maker. And in that in the classes that I teach here at Harvard, I go through the strategies both before you get to the negotiating table. When we go inside the negotiating table, we go inside your heads. We think about issues, emotional intelligence. We go behind the table. We think about teams. We go across the table. 
we think about the mediating strategies you can use. And we go even beyond the table to think about the future. That is the kind of framework that you would get if you were thinking about taking your negotiation to the next to the next level. Before I run out of time, let me just give you a quick summary of where we've been and then we we go to the to the Q&A and we really have some fun. If it hasn't been fun already, I hope it's been it's been good fun. Now, let's just summarize where we've been. We chatted a little bit about positions versus interests, the core of the win-win negotiation method. We went over the, the listening principles. We thought about deepening questions, the questions that open up the conversations versus shut it down. We've talked about some practical tips for preparing and negotiating face-to-face, -face, as well as some everyday applications of email uh, for, for, for email negotiations and Zoom negotiations. And finally, I just gave you a preview of the, of the Kogan uh, framework. It's been such a pleasure doing this webinar for you, with you. Um, would love to um, hear your questions. Please submit them uh, in the chat. And I now am delighted to invite uh, my colleague, Jacqueline, uh, to uh, join us for the live Q&A. Jacqueline. Thanks so much, Eugene. And thank you all for your fantastic questions you've submitted so far. We've also gathered the questions that you submitted during registration and hope to triage some of those to Eugene. Eugene, I'd just like to say that I already have, you know, a long list of mental tips I've gained from this, this webinar. So thank you so much. It was very insightful and I'm ready to have some fun answering some questions. So my first question for you, it. yes, um, is, is being a successful and effective negotiator innate or something gained through practice and education? My gosh, Jacqueline, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing if I thought it was innate. Um, and if I didn't believe with every fiber of my being that we can all get better uh, and exercise that negotiating muscle. And so I, I encourage everybody on the call and uh, joining us today and perhaps watching us later on, if you are, if you feel there's growth uh, to be to be gained, please join us. And if you feel you've or you're already masterful at negotiation, please don't stop there because there's more to learn. I know I learn so much. I mean, to to be honest with you, Jacqueline, and with everybody watching and listening, for me, the joy of professional and executive development, the kinds of programs that I teach here, is that I learned the, the dirty little secret. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna clue you in on something that we executive education instructors never want to admit. Okay, ready? We learn so much from you participants in executive education. In fact, we learn oftentimes more from you than we bring to the classroom. And that's not a surprise because in my, in my upcoming class tomorrow, in fact, there is literally 470 years of accumulated experience in the classroom. Jacqueline, if I can't learn from 470 years of experience in the classroom, I don't know whether it's innate or it's learned, of course it's of course it's learned. So you can you can feel my excitement about taking that learning to the next level. But thank you for the question. That's really powerful, Eugene. Four hundred seventy years of experience, and I have to say, you know, hearing some from some of our other instructors as well, they always say they feel like they learn more from our participants than sometimes they think the participants learn from them. Which, you know, is just being humble because you're all great, but. That's great. 100%. 100%. Um, so we, you know, we we saw that we had people from all over the world today, pretty much representing every continent. Um, someone and a couple people actually have asked, how can you incorporate cross-cultural sensitivity into negotiation? A huge topic on which I personally am not the greatest expert, but a huge topic on which I, I have strong views and I, I think it's really important. 
um, how to incorporate it in a couple of different ways. I definitely, before going somewhere where into a culture to negotiate in a culture with which I am not as familiar, um, I definitely uh, consult with people who have negotiated in it before. And I definitely take a broad cut of, of, of individuals from different backgrounds, ideally different ages, ideally those who have negotiated there at different times with different constituencies. And secondly, though, so learning from real experience, because from a variety of experience, do you really get a good, a good sense of what's really happening, what's really true, what's really salient versus something that's just superficial? And then there is terrific literature on uh, cross-cultural cross -cultural negotiations and how culture influences uh, negotiation. And finally, at least for speaking as an American and speaking as somebody who's American who travels internationally, just came back from a, a, a month in, in, in Europe uh, doing all kinds of keynotes and negotiation training, et cetera, being very conscious, very deeply conscious. And again, the tips that I gave you that I offered on videotaping yourself, I'm, I'm being on that balcony, Jacqueline, and folks who are watching and listening. So important to be aware of your own both historical and current biases and pre predispositions. Just knowing how you come across, really advise everybody who is listening, everybody who's on the call, watching and listening to be very attuned to how they come across and seek from close friends who are unafraid to give you unvarnished truth. There is so much kind of, oh, I can't tell you this, Jacqueline, because I like you so much. I can't, I, I, yeah, I'd like to, but I, I don't want to hurt your feelings. If you are my, my friend, if you truly want to help me get better, Tell me openly, say, Eugene, I, you know, I, I just got to tell you, it'll help you if you in, in, in your future negotiations. Get that trusted confidant to that trusted friend who maybe will give you sometimes kind of painful feedback, <laughs> um, but very useful for your future negotiations, cross-cultural or not. Those are some great tips, Eugene, and I love your metaphor of the balcony. I think that's applicable to, you know, the several different examples of negotiation you discussed in your presentation, but also I think, you know, speaking for myself, but everyone sitting there, I'm sure we can all, you know, use that visual when we're next faced with a tough negotiation. So thank you for that. Kind of along the same vein, we had a question in the chat um, around gender dynamics. And so I was wondering, if you feel comfortable, uh, what are some additional tips for women um, when preparing and during negotiation? So um, depending on the context, and, and again, this is coming uh, from a man. So, so take that with the, uh, with the grain of salt that it comes with uh, and with humility with which it comes with. Um, the, you know, uh, depending on the context in which you find yourself, finding that assertiveness is can be absolutely crucial. Um, earlier in my career, um, as you may know, Jacqueline, I have had the privilege of meeting all of the American secretaries of state from Henry Kissinger, who's just passed away, to Rex Tillerson. And one of the most inspiring ones, uh, no doubt for me, was Madam Secretary. And by Madam Secretary, I can only mean Madam Secretary Madeleine Albright, um, who passed away several years ago. And Madeleine Albright um, famously said, there's a special place in hell for women who don't support other women. And that 
phrase is extremely important to me. So when you're getting into a negotiation or when you're negotiating a lot of times multilaterally, um, advice for women, look out for each other um, and be there and, and looking out for each other and, and recognizing each other it can just begin with saying each other's name. It all begins with our name. It begins with, well, a position, instead of saying, well, a position we hear from there. You could say, well, Jacqueline just offered and Marsha just responded. And maybe Michael's, uh, Michael's point is interesting because it's different from Jacqueline's. Those things like saying somebody's name can be an extremely powerful lever in negotiation, may seem like a small detail, but for the person involved can mean absolutely uh, the world. And that was Madeline Albright's um, uh, advice. The other, the other piece of advice, uh, again, drawing on another Secretary of State, and by the way, every time, literally almost every single class I teach at Harvard and all over the world, I use Madeleine Albright's videos where she describes uh, stepping up and being assertive on the world stage uh, as a woman, as a trailblazing woman. So it's a and it's a fantastic uh, learning tool to help both men and women. I mean, I kid you not, Jacqueline and and folks who are who are listening and watching. I truly will tell you, more people come up to me after my lectures, after my keynotes, and say, "Very interesting." And I will always remember Madam Secretary's phrase on this. I will always remember how she spoke up. I mean the. Force the force of nature that Madeleine Albright had uh, has to be recognized. And the other the other example, uh, a real example that Condoleezza Rice and other uh, Secretary of State who I've had the great privilege of meeting and speaking with, when she describes when Vladimir Putin tried to intimidate her, um, uh, and it's a it's a famous it's it's on YouTube. You can find the the. Uh, the example that she gives where he tried to tower over her and she stood up in response, not intimidated. And as she put it, on my heels, I was taller than him. Uh, and and it's a, another way of thinking about, uh, again, with all humility for women, how you, how you think about those kinds of interactions. Of course, Condoleezza Rice brought a deep understanding of her counterpart, a deep historical understanding of where he came from. She's a scholar of the Soviet Union. So preparing yourself for negotiations, preparing yourself, what I call in the Kogan framework, before the table is, is absolutely important. Don't want to take too much time on that question, but it was such an important one. I hope I did it justice. You did it more better than justice, Eugene. That was so powerful. I know I'm going to walk away with those examples, probably be sharing those for the remainder of the day. So thank you. And um, kind of on, again, the same vein, you brought up the example of a couple of times intimidation. So a couple of people in the chat were asking, what are some practical tips for negotiating during a, a somewhat contentious discussion where the counterparty tries to intimidate you? Um, do you have any practical tips on how to handle yourself in that situation? Two-step process I always recommend. The, beginning with the questioning your assumption, I, I know it feels like intimidation. But, and I know in the moment, the, the impulse is uh, fight or flight. I will fight this. Or I will just walk away from this. There's a third option there, folks. Question it. Give them a chance to give them a chance to explain themselves. And you do that by a true two-pronged, two-pronged, not strategy, by a tactic. 
Number one, name the game. Name the game. Tell them how they come across very calmly, very sort of with great equanimity. Just say, you know, you're coming on very strong. This is this is very, you know, I came, I came in for a business discussion. This is this is very like. I feel the environment is quite uncomfortable. Is that do you you do realize that that's the way you're coming across? Just very calmly name the game. Tell them you know the game they are they may be playing. You're therefore giving them a chance to step back. Maybe just maybe they're anxious. Maybe they're under pressure from behind the table, right? Another part of the Kogan framework. Maybe they're under other pressures. Maybe they're just by virtue of their intense personality. They're coming on to, you know, they're coming on so strong that they, it looks like they're trying to intimidate you, but that's not at all what they're trying to do. So you're basically telling them, hey, back off. Do you realize how you come across? And if naming the game is part one, but then clarify the stakes. If they continue doing what they're doing, right? You, you've named the game, you, you've told them, look, you come on very strong, that's not what I'm here for, it's not what I want, and I won't stand for it. Not necessarily that I will fight this, but just not the game I wanna play. This is not getting to yes, this is part of the deal, if you will, if you want to make the distinction between the two sort of the two sides of the negotiation continuum, the the win-win and the and the competitive distributive um, type of negotiation. And then you clarify the stakes. You say, listen, I, I think I've made myself very clear. This is this is not what I am here for. And if you want to continue like this, I've, I've just given you the chance to change behavior. I've given you a chance to change the way you you approach this negotiation. If we continue like this, here's what gonna be, here's what's gonna happen. And then you have to outline the stakes, the the what's gonna happen. And the stakes might be we're gonna end up in a lose-lose, meaning I'm not gonna make a deal with you. I won't keep, I won't stay intimidated, I will just walk away. And you will lose a ton. And then you have to know what's at stake for the other person. That's why you're clarifying the stakes. You have to understand what the person is there for. Because ultimately, folks, Jacqueline, the person at the table is not there just because they want to intimidate you. They're not wasting their time. If, in fact, they're trying to intimidate you, their intimidation is a means to an end and the end it's not the end it's not that they are i mean maybe there are absolute sadists who just enjoy intimidating people but in negotiation most likely this is a means to an end meaning using intimidation to get a better deal well that deal isn't coming my friend that's your message right first i name the game i tell you i know what you are doing Yes, I've taken the webinar on win-win negotiation ostensibly with Dr. Kogan, but he taught us about how to handle the tough counterparts. And what we do with tough counterparts is we clarify the stakes. And the stakes are, I'm going to walk away and you are going to lose whatever, a million dollars, you're going to lose that order and you'll have to explain it to your board. You'll have to explain it to your boss. Is that something you want to do? Or maybe, just maybe you want to change behavior. You want to change, you want to take a break, cool down, come back, and let's start again. And maybe we start again on a different note entirely. But always be prepared 
final comment on this, Jacqueline. Always be prepared to walk away. Um, I mean, James, you know, uh, James Bond, another one of my, I've already mentioned the Godfather, so I have to mention James Bond. There was this wonderful character, for those of you who are James Bond aficionados, called Q, the old gentleman who gives James Bond all the fancy cars and the exploding pens. And there's a wonderful scene in James Bond movie once where Q, this aging master, says to, to Bond, he says, I've always given you two pieces of advice. And Pierce Brosnan, who at the time was James Bond, says, okay, Q, what is it? And Q says, Bond, I've always taught you, never let them see you bleed. Never let them see, see you bleed. And number two, always have an escape plan. And always have an escape plan. Always have a, a walk away plan, which we, of course, in the negotiation jargon, we call it BACNA, the best alternative to negotiated agreement. Always walk into a negotiation with a strong BACNA, or at least with a decent BACNA to which you can, to which you can walk, right? So going into any negotiation, tough or not tough, easy, and I would be beware of negotiations that look easy because no negotiation is easy. Um, always try to go into negotiation with a strong alternative, plan B, right? Plan B, escape plan, otherwise known as, as BACNA. From the book Getting to Yes, those of you who have read it will recognize the abbreviation. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Eugene. I think that's, you know, ending on a really positive note. Um, and it just kind of seems from all your answers that what a lot of these boil down to is, you know, preparation, understanding, um, you know, human emotion, your emotion and your counterparts, and effectively communicating. So thank you so much for all these tips. And thank you to everyone for your very thoughtful questions. Um, if we weren't able to get to your question or you have a question about our programs, you can send us an email at pdp at dce.harvard.edu. If you'd like to continue this conversation with Eugene um, and learn more about negotiation, please join us on March 4th for our next program. Um, many of our previous participants have found that Eugene's program has been insightful and empowering. One said, I love how Eugene can teach the toughest topics and still find space for connection and fun. Another said, highly recommend one of the best props I've ever had. And to conclude the presentation for today, I want to thank Eugene. Thank you so much again for sharing your insight and your experience. And thank you all so much for attending this webinar. If you have any questions, like I mentioned, please email us at pdp at dce.harvard.edu or call us at 617-988-8500. Please also follow us on social media or visit our website to keep updated on our programs and hear some more tips from instructors like Eugene. You can scan this QR code and find our social handles. We'd also uh, like to remind you that in the next few days, a recording of this webinar will be sent to the email address you used to register along with the slide decks. And lastly, if you would like to connect with Eugene on LinkedIn, please scan this QR code. Um, Eugene, I hear so many great things about, you know, how you connect with participants during sessions afterwards. So Eugene's a great resource. And finally, I'd like to just thank you all again for joining us. We're so thrilled that you came from all over the world to be here with us today. And we hope to see you in one of our programs soon.